say that my last international trip that I took before the COVID pandemic was to India. And while I was there, I visited the National Law University in Delhi, and I was given a copy of the Constitution of India. And what we're talking about today is the, or what I'll be talking about is the Chicago Convention 1944. And uh, this is in many respects, the constitution of international civil aviation. Um, just to say also that uh, on our program that we teach here, which is an advanced LLM in air and space law, uh, at the moment, we have we have about 25 students, and three of them are your fellow countrymen uh, from India, uh, a lady, uh, two ladies, and one man. So, um, and uh, so let's get started. So, once upon a time, uh, there was the view that uh, taking from the Latin maxim, which goes "Q is at solum, U is at usque, at colum, at ad imperos." Uh, I don't expect anyone speaks a fluent Latin. I surely don't, but it effectively translates to whosoever's, whosoever is the soil, it is theirs all the way to heaven and all the way to hell. In other words, owning land, terra firma, the sultan, the king, the, the uh, queen, uh, is then uh, has control of all things, all the way to the heavens and all the way to hell. Well, of course, this has an impact for airspace, and that maxim didn't last very long. By the time we got to uh, the technology advance to have air travel, but before we even had aircraft, of course, we had balloons, uh, which were being used, hydrogen balloons, for hundreds of years. But if we fast forward to 1903, we know about the Wright brothers. So this is a good example. They didn't fly very far, but showed that this was possible for passenger transport. And in that same year, 1903, we had the Frenchman, Paul Fouchille, who suggested that airspace should be limited in terms of altitude to 500 meters. Now, the Eiffel Tower in Paris at that time stood at 300 meters. So to some extent, that was, I mean, much higher than the Eiffel Tower, surely that was not, we were not to go much higher than that in aviation. Well, we know that's not the case uh, nowadays, but just to give you some context there about um, the earliest talk, if you like, of aviation uh, law or the limits of aviation. Well, following World War II, we had the French government invite uh, delegates from around the world to Paris to a conference on air navigation. And uh, at that conference, uh, they agreed to a draft convention and this is an important starting point for public international air law because it's our first ever international convention in this area of public air law. You've heard uh, from Professor Reddy about the Warsaw Convention, which of course came in 1929, so sometime later. So this is our very first um, um, uh, piece of international law in this area. Anyway, there are two takeaways from the Paris Convention. One is Article 1 which says the high contracting parties recognize that every power has complete and exclusive sovereignty over the airspace above its territory. And goes on to say that this is, of course, in a colonial context, 1919. So it goes on to say this includes territory of the national territory, that is the mother country and of the colonies, but also to the territorial waters adjacent to those land masses. This is quite important because it recognizes, you know, it doesn't say establishes, but that the parties at that time recognize the concept of sovereignty, state sovereignty, that is the freedom from outside uh, uh, interference with one's domestic affairs and so on. Uh, so that's one takeaway, sovereignty as a guiding principle of aviation. The second takeaway is ICANN, which is the International Commission or was the International Commission for Air Navigation. We now have the Air Navigation Co Commission, ANC, but anyway, this is our very first body in this area uh, for dealing with air navigation and the issues. And it was established by the Paris Convention. So it's been around for quite some time. And you can see from Article 34 there, who is part of this? Well. The permanent commission was placed under the League of Nations, which of course is the precursor uh, to the United Nations. Uh, and just if you see there are two representatives from the US, two from France, two from Italy, two from Japan, the aviation powers of the day, one representative from Great Britain, one from each of the British dominions and one from India. 
and then one representative from each of the other contracting states. So you can see already from 1919, sort of who are the power players there? And of course, India uh, is at the table from the very start. So if we fast forward to, uh, well, through World War II, uh, which of course didn't end until 1945, it's interesting that the US government, uh, seeing the end of World War II in sight, invited delegates from, again, around the world to Chicago this time um, to uh, put together a new, com a new convention, uh, which, is, which was slightly more detailed. Uh, and um, this convention opened uh, on the 7th of December, 1944, opened for signature. And again, an Indian reference, uh, India was there and, and signed on that day, the convention. Uh, it was ratified in 1947 alongside other countries like the UK and US and so on. And the convention entered into force in 1947. So well after World War II had ended, this convention was ready, it was in force, and we could proceed with the sustainable and orderly development of international civil aviation operations. So I don't know if you can see from the slide there, what is the big change between 1919 and 1944 in Article 1? Well, there's only two things really, high contracting parties to contracting states, and also the spelling of recognized has changed from the British spelling to the American spelling. Now, the Chicago Convention established the initially the preliminary uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, which became the International Civil Aviation Organization. And this is uh, one of two UN specialized agencies uh, that exist. The other is the International Maritime Organization, which is based in London. But the ICAO, as we call it, um, is, is based in Montreal. And at the moment, we have 193 contracting states. So effectively, the entire globe is covered. You can only be a member if you are a state. So like the European Union is not a member, ASEAN cannot be a member, and so on. Um, but they are observers alongside the industry representative bodies, like the airline representative body, IATA, the International Air Transport Association, or the body that represents airports, or the body that represents air traffic controllers, and so on. So they are uh, represented through their member states, right, and the airlines of the member states and so on, but actually they're observers, so they stand at the back of the room in the plenary. The next General Assembly, they happen every three years at ICAO, the next one is coming up here at the end of September, first week of October, and it's important just to note here that India's role, again, um, very important role at the, at the moment, India is sitting on the ICAO Council, which of those 193 states, there are only 36 which sit on council and are permanently based for three years, uh, for a three-year term in Montreal. And India is there, and, and currently the council member for India may be a, a name that's very well known to, to many of you in India, uh, Dr. Shefali Junea. Um, Article 2 of the Chicago Convention, a little like the second part of Article 1 of the Paris Convention, says that the uh, territory is both the land areas and the territorial waters adjacent thereto under the sovereignty, suzerainty, protection, or mandate of such state. In other words, when we talk about the airspace above the territory, we also extend it outwards to include the territorial waters. And we call that, well, 12 nautical miles from the coast. Now, this is interesting because now I'm talking about water. And so from air to water, of course, we rely in air law very much on maritime law um, and notably the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. And I won't go into detail on this, but you can see reference to the sovereignty of a coastal state like India uh, beyond its land territory and its internal waters, rivers and lakes and so on, extending outwards to the territorial waters. And then where we have an archipelagic state like the Philippines with many small islands, uh, it covers that entire area. And I have some maps on the next slide which will show you how that works. The second point is the sovereignty extends therefore over the airspace above the territorial sea as well as to the bed and some so that's not so relevant to us in air law. So here are some pictures. On the top left, you've got the European Union, more or less. Well, there's also Turkey there and EEA, anyway, Europe, uh, broadly defined. And you see the yellow uh, bits are the land areas. 
And then you see the kind of orange bits, which are the uh, territorial waters. And then you see this turquoise color, not quite light blue, but turquoise, uh, which, is, which are the uh, exclusive economic zones. And there's a bit of a question then in law about economic EEZ or exclusive economic zone and airspace. How does that work exactly? Well, in the bottom right, you'll see how that works. You have the national airspace, which extends over an archipelagic state, like the top right corner, Philippines. So extends over all of those waters, internal waters, um, and also includes the territorial sea. So uh, we have then from where the exclusive economic zone starts, which means in, in maritime law that uh, states have certain rights to fish. Of course, we always say, well, fish move. <laughs> Uh, so we have to account for this somehow. Uh, so the exclusive economic zone is not only in fish, but also in oil and, and other things, uh, minerals and so on, resources in the continental shelf. The point for us in aviation law is this is all international airspace. Yeah, Some of that is under the EEZ, which have maritime you know, rights and so, so on, but then we also have the high seas there. Okay, and here's another nice archipelagic in your neighborhood, sort of, uh, which is uh, Indonesia. Again, huge national sovereign airspace because there are so many islands. And so we take the internal waters between all the islands in Indonesia, we circle it off and we say, this is the sovereign airspace. And then we add 12 nautical miles and we say, well, that's the territorial water. So all of that is the territorial sovereign airspace of Indonesia. So we've established how wide it is. How high it is is another question. And I saw some questions coming in the Q&A beforehand about space law. Well, this is an age old question. Where is the boundary between uh, airspace and outer space? Uh, suffice it to say that some agree that it's uh, around 100 kilometers up, although commercial aircraft are not flying so high. That's maybe for another day. OK. so. Um, the over the high seas, all states, whether you are a coastal state or a landlocked state, you have the right to access the high seas by boat, by ship. You have the freedom of navigation, and that freedom extends upwards to include the airspace over the high seas, so the international airspace. Um, and in exercising those rights of usage, we should have due regard for all other states. This is a kind of a guiding principle of international law. Okay, back to the Chicago Convention then. So we have also rules over the uh, high seas. It's not that just because no one can claim sovereignty in the airspace over the high seas that there are is no law. In fact, uh, there are rules which are set out in the annexes to the Chicago Convention. And in Annex 2, which is called the Rules of the Air, we have uh, a number of rules about yeah, how the aircraft uh, operation should be done, how uh, signals should be given, that English is the, uh, uh, the language of aviation. So pilots uh, are, are expected to speak English clearly and pronounce in a certain way. They're expected to say Alpha, Bravo, uh, and so on, Charlie Delta, uh, and not ABCD. Uh, anyway, the point is that in the annexes to the convention, and there are 19 at the moment, there are all sorts of standards, rules. Aviation is a very heavily standard, standardized and standard driven uh, uh, sector. And that's a, for one reason alone, that is safety, which is in first place. So airspace sovereignty, as we saw from Article 1 of Paris Convention, Article 1 of Chicago Convention, it is complete and exclusive. So this means that it's all encompassing. OK, well, take a deep breath, because actually there are some uh, attributes of that sovereignty. In fact, we know that aircraft are flying over, foreign aircraft are flying over in Indian sovereign airspace, and uh, Indian aircraft are flying in other, uh, over other states and so on. How does that work exactly? Well, it's interesting that it uh, can work at all because in Chicago in 1944, the parties could not agree on a multilateral several state uh, agreement to really open up the skies for everyone. And that's because of protectionism. 
of course, exchanging rights of uh, traffic rights is uh, a way of making money for a national airline. Uh, and so some states, India in particular, uh, has been uh, protect pr protective in the past uh, with respect to exchanging traffic rights with other foreign carriers, because of course it wants it to be a level playing field. Uh, the former Air India, now we uh, invented here, but anyway, the, you know, had to be protected so that, so in fact, British Airways and Air India should have an, a level footing, an equal opportunity to compete on the market between, say, Europe or North America and India. And that, uh, of course, makes a lot of sense to us, to our ears today, fair competition and so on. Anyway, the point is that this is enabled, well, first of all, it's disabled, uh, this kind of traffic rights through Article 6 of the Chicago Convention, which says that no scheduled international air service may be operated without express permission. So the airspace, the sovereign airspace, which we've established is so wide and so high roughly, uh, is closed by law, by Article 6. Now, this means that states have to negotiate on a bilateral or multilateral basis to exchange traffic rights. So really airlines are dependent on states to sit down at the negotiation table and exchange rights and determine how many times a day a flight, uh, an Air India or British Airways flight can fly between London and Delhi. Um, and this is done through air services agreements, ASAs. Now we did have some success in 1944 through the International Air Transit Agreement, which provides for the parties to it, uh, uh, exchange the first two freedoms of the air, which are the freedom of overflight and the freedom to stop for non-traffic purposes. Now, non-traffic purpose is not to unload or pick up passengers or cargo, but to stop and get and refuel or stop and, and have a maintenance check of an aircraft, something like this. So I'm sure you're thinking, well, those are essential. We have to have freedom of overflight. We have to have, be able to stop in an emergency and so on. So that is not universal, but why there's wide coverage of that. It's when you start to pick up passengers and drop them off or pick up passengers uh, in, let's say, uh, uh, London, take them uh, via uh, India to Sri Lanka, let's say. How does that work exactly? Is Sri Lanka happy with passengers being transported through India? Or would they rather than come directly to Sri Lanka? Or would they rather than come through some other country? So it all becomes rather political, if you can hear, um, economic, socio-economic and political. The International Air Transport Agreement 1944 was not uh, a huge success. And if you're interested in that, you could Google it and, and see all about it. Now, Article 7 of the convention provides that states may refuse to allow cabotage. And again, this is a concept which comes from maritime law. Uh, cabotage is effectively domestic carriage by a foreign carrier. So this would be, let's say, uh, uh, Lufthansa, the German airline I used to work for. Lufthansa operating flights between Mumbai and Bangalore, for instance. Of course, this would not be desirable for Indian airlines. Uh, why should a foreign airline operate these routes? It will take business away from us. There may also be safety questions uh, about it. We would rather our own airline fly our own citizens and residents. Um, so it is not expressly prohibited, but states have the right to refuse it, Article 7. And most states do refuse it. We also have an Article 8 uh, that aircraft which are capable of being flown without a pilot will not be flown. Uh, without express authorization again. So that's interesting because already we see in 1944, the vision, uh, the ideas of unmanned aircraft. And there's no, it's not exactly clear whether they mean pilot or pilot on board. I mean, when you fly a drone, for instance, of course there is a pilot, the pilot is just on the ground. But there are through uh, artificial intelligence and so on, there are of course pilotless aircraft which are then operating on a computer sense. Anyway, so Article 8, we need permission if we're to cross borders. If it's a foreign drone, a foreign un unmanned aircraft, special permission must be granted first. States also have the right, I should have said that at the start, I'm talking today about the rights of states and the duties of states. So we're still on the rights. States have the right to prohibit or declare as prohibited, restricted, or danger areas. 
So you can imagine that, I don't know, uh, uh, the, the airspace above Buckingham Palace, the airspace above Windsor Castle or uh, above the White House is restricted, right? Prohibited airspace. You may not overfly it for security reasons. So states can do that, but they must make that uh, requirement, that declaration uniform for all other states. So all states must be prohibited from flying over the White House, not only foreign airlines, according to the convention. Article 89, of course, it was drafted in a wartime, so there's a war provision. In case of war, the provisions of the convention don't affect the freedom of action of any state, whether it's belligerents or as neutrals. Um, and the same is true if we have a state of national emergency. So if a state declares national emergency, then we can suspend the Chicago Convention uh, rights and, and, and duties at the, from that time. Just looking at my watch. Article 11 uh, is important. That's that point I just mentioned on Article 9 about the prohibited zones. The uh, states must I mean, states have the right to establish certain rules, uh, but these rules must be applied without distinction as to nationality. This is really important because it's the guiding principle, or one of them, of the Chicago Convention, which is non-discrimination and equal treatment. In fact, all states should have the right, the opportunity, to compete on the market for air services. And so there shouldn't be any kind of, um, should we say, unfair uh, restrictions on certain aircraft from certain uh, states and so on. Of course, we see in reality that this does happen, uh, but we see it then quickly uh, uh, followed by an explanation. And that explanation is usually something around security, safety, uh, or at least that's what is, um, is, is claimed. Article 13 is also a key one, I think, for us. States have the right to require uh, certain uh, rules or certain uh, procedures are followed with respect to passengers, crew, cargo. Uh, so we see this with respect to immigration uh, procedures, passports, customs, and I've just made bold there quarantine, which is something which for a long time we didn't uh, think very much about, but now is a common concept for us, the, the idea of quarantine. Uh, and I think this goes really nicely with the next article of the Chicago Convention, which is Article 14. Uh, this is not a duty, but a, uh, sorry, not a right, but the duty of states to uh, prevent the spread of disease through aviation. Of course, we know from the current pandemic that uh, COVID has spread very quickly around the world through people traveling. Uh, so aviation has facilitated, in a negative sense, uh, COVID to be spread very quickly to different parts of the world. And so we've seen the reaction to that. And in some respects, the states are pointing to this. They're saying under international law, we have the duty to prevent the spread of disease through civil aviation. That's why we close our airspace, close our borders, or require quarantine measures. Article 16. Um, is just that the states have the right to search aircraft and to inspect certificates and other documents. So again, I'm, I'm giving you, I mean, the Chicago Convention is uh, typically when I'm teaching this to my, to my students here in Leiden, this is something we spend an entire semester on public air law. So I'm just giving you a glimpse into the Chicago Convention and trying in a bit to just highlight the key provisions without doing uh, sort of an injustice to, the, to the, this constitution not this constitution, but the aviation constitution. So search and inspect. There's the, the right uh, of, the, of the airline to do that. Now, Article uh, 12 um, talks about the nationality mark. And uh, air, every aircraft must display its nationality mark, uh, which is quite clear. Uh, you know, For instance, in, in Germany, it's D hyphen. In the Netherlands, it's PH. And Great Britain, it's G, and North America, it's N, and so on, right? So there we can see immediately from that registration, what is the nationality of that aircraft? Not the airline, but the aircraft. Where is that aircraft registered? And that's quite important because if the aircraft is registered in a state which is not following the standards I mentioned, the SARTs, 
uh, not living up to their obligations under international rules and, and agreements, then certain states may say, we will not permit these aircraft to use our airspace. We're afraid they'll fall out of the sky, right? Uh, that something will happen on board and so on. So we see a harmonization. These rules are harmonized, whether over the high seas, the international airspace of the high seas, uh, or over sovereign airspace, they are more or less the same rules, or at least the same minimum standards. And that should give us all a little confidence when we uh, fly, uh, because we know that uh, things are being, uh, we, we have a standard uh, minimum uh, safety level. Okay, we're nearing the end here of my little introduction. We have Article 3. Uh, and I think I heard Professor Reddy also talking about state aircraft or military aircraft and, and civilian aircraft. Well, the Chicago Convention, like the Paris Convention before it, uh, applies only to civil aircraft. It doesn't apply to state aircraft. And we could discuss for a long time what do we mean by state aircraft, but certainly military aircraft are state aircraft. Uh, and those used by the state. So uh, if the prime minister or president or king uh, flies, so then it's probably a state aircraft. The point is that state aircraft are referred to uh, in the annexes to the Chicago Convention, because of course aircraft, whether they are state aircraft, military or civilian aircraft, and now increasingly with space uh, launches, they're sharing the same airspace. So of course there needs to be some coordination between state aircraft, civilian aircraft, and now increasingly launches. Article 15 is also quite important. Um, it just provides that if you uh, open your uh, air, airport, open an airport for use by national aircraft, then it should be open under the same sorts of conditions for aircraft of all other contracting states. Now you could put a little footnote there and say, well, not all airports are capable of providing customs services. Not all airports have passport control or immigration services or uh, customs and quarantine and so on. So states must uh, uh, declare which aerodromes, which airports are customs airports and therefore per, by definition international airports. Um, the point is that no fees, dues or other charges can be imposed no state can impose a cost to enter airspace, exit airspace, or transit over airspace, uh, transit over territory rather, transit through airspace. That's quite important because um, of course you do pay something when you use airspace, but it's not an entry fee. Rather, it's a fee that you pay as an air airline to the air traffic controllers on the ground because they are guiding your aircraft. So you have a contract for services there. You get guidance and you pay a fee. That's not the same thing as entering the airspace and paying a fee to use the airspace. The airspace is free. Um, and when we think about environmental protection, uh, emissions and so on, aircraft emissions, this becomes a bit touchy, this Article 15, because it appears or might appear that um, uh, that some states are requiring airlines to pay something to use the airspace through uh, surrendering licenses to pollute or engaging in market-based measures and so on. So that's another area of, of public uh, air law. Anyway, states also have the duty to um, uh, assist aircraft in distress. What is an aircraft in distress? Well, it's distress is a condition of being threatened by grave and or imminent danger and requiring immediate assistance. So again, states have a duty to step in, a positive duty to react and help other contracting states, apostrophe aircraft. Article 26, if an accident or incident occurs, then states have a duty to inquire, launch an inquiry. And then it sets out which state should do this exactly. So you can think about the examples of MH370 disappear initially, MH17 shot down, presumably initially, uh, then an inquiry should be launched. Um, and it should be launched by the state in which this thing happens. And of course, the, uh, the uh, aircraft nationality, again, the mark, where is that aircraft registered? That state will also want to be part of that inquiry as will perhaps um, the US if it's a Boeing aircraft, let's say, 
as a manufacturer, right? To make sure, was it something wrong with the aircraft? We wanna make sure this doesn't happen again. Uh, Article 28 states, of course, must also provide airports uh, and air navigation facilities. That almost goes without saying, but uh, this is quite important as uh, without airports and air navigation facilities, there's no air civil aviation. Okay, nearing, nearing the end here. Article 33, on the basis of reciprocity, states will uh, recognize, shall recognize as valid any kind of certificate of competence, license and so on that one state contracting state issues. So uh, a license uh, for an for a, a airline captain, let's say, um, uh, who, is, uh, who is licensed in India, that will then be recognized by all other 192 contracting states uh, to the Chicago Convention. Um, so you have this, there's no need to get a new license if you're starting to uh, fly from other uh, airports and other jurisdictions. Article 37, I mentioned the SARPs before, the standards and recommended practices. There's a whole range of them, as I mentioned at the start, there are 19, but there are things like operation of aircraft, air traffic services, search and rescue, aerodromes, airports, security, so an outside risk, safety management, dangerous goods, um, environmental protection, which is really at the top of the agenda at the moment. Safety is always there, but environmental protection is really a big thing at the moment, um, and telecommunications. But it's interesting, uh, are these standards binding legally? Well, they're not treaty provisions, right? They're not in the convention themselves, they're annexes to the convention. And states can file a difference. So if, if the state practice is different from the standard, the state has a duty to file a difference with ICAO to say that our practice doesn't meet that standard. It's different. That might not be a huge issue, but it's a positive, it's again, a duty on a state to report this. And then other states on knowing this information may decide to exclude aircraft from that contracting state from using their own sovereign airspace. So that's all found in article 38. My last slide for you today is just to uh, maybe get you thinking a bit. Article three biz. Well, the Chicago convention since it was opened for signature in 1944 has been amended very few times. But it was amended by squeezing an article between three and four, so three biz between the two, um, in 1984. And this was following a number of uh, interceptions of aircraft, civilian aircraft that were intercepted by uh, military aircraft. And in all too many uh, instances, these civilian aircraft being shot down. Uh, some cases, the passengers and crew survived, other cases, they perished. Uh, and so the international community responded to this and came up with this rather, for lawyers, I think we'll agree, rather uh, carefully drafted, understandably, because it's diplomacy, you need to please everyone, or almost everyone. The contracting states recognize that every state must refrain from resorting to the use of weapons against civil aircraft in flight. And that in the case of an interception, so another aircraft intercepting the civilian aircraft, the lives of persons on board and the safety of aircraft must not be endangered. So a few questions for you there. What is a weapon? Is an aircraft a weapon? What do we mean by civil aircraft? Do we mean foreign aircraft? Or do we mean our own domestic civil aircraft? And what do we mean by in flight? Do we mean in flight? Or do we mean on the ground with the door closed where the captain is still the lawful commander on board the aircraft? Well, maybe that's some food for thought. I thank you uh, for your time and I'm open to any questions. My God, this was extremely, extremely interesting. And, you know, we are already getting comments around how good the presentation is and how much the students are liking it. You know, I have got many questions for you. I'm sure. <laughs> let's just start, let's just take as many as we can. So there is. One from Anuleka, she is asking, so what happens in cases of a disagreement between two or more contracting states relating to the application and interpretation of the Chicago Convention? Mm. Excellent question. So you've already gone as a good lawyer to, let's, we have a dispute. What are we gonna do about it? 
Um, so Article 84 of the Chicago Convention sets out uh, a dispute resolution procedure. And there have been a number of examples of this. And one uh, in your own backyard, as I might say, is a, a famous dispute or infamous dispute uh, between Pakistan and India in 1971, um, where the airspace uh, Pakistan was restricted. So Indian aircraft, Indian registered aircraft could not overfly uh, Pakistan airspace, I think at the time, West Pakistan airspace. And you can imagine on a flight between Delhi and Kabul in, in Afghanistan, a direct flight is 900 miles or something like this, but if you have to go around, all the way around, then you're looking at 2,000 or more than 2,000 miles. So costly in terms of fuel and in terms of time. And plus you get the aircraft, which is not available for you to, to fly to other destinations. The point is that that dispute, uh, and we won't talk about the origins of the dispute, but in aviation, it became a dispute because, of course, the airspace should be open to all contracting states, according to the convention, right? We've just seen that today. So in that, in that event, then, what happens is um, India would then approach ICAO Council, and uh, ICAO Council would establish a tribunal, an ad hoc tribunal, and that tribunal would then uh, look at the dispute and give a decision. And if that decision was not agreeable to the parties, then that decision can, could be appealed to the International Court of Justice down the road here in The Hague. Very, very few instances of this, of, of cases reaching The Hague, reaching the ICJ. But if you're interested in this, whoever asked the, asked the question, or if you have others uh, who are interested in this, a more recent examples is 1999 in the Hushkate, Hushkits case between the EU and the US, or more recently, the case between Qatar and Bahrain, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and uh, Egypt. How very interesting. I'm going to take another question. Uh, is the airspace where nobody claims sovereignty be governed by the doctrine of common heritage of mankind? Uh, Similar I, to the seas beyond, yeah. <laughs> Similar to the seas beyond easy, Pradyuman Sharma. Yeah, good question. But this is actually um, moving upwards to space. Yeah. I mean, the guiding, uh, well, there's a lot of discussion about this, the common, common heritage of mankind that space and the the exploration of space and so on is actually belongs to all of us. Uh, in other words, no state, no private entity, no rich Richard Branson or Elon Musk uh, should uh, appropriate anything in space. I mean, land or minerals and so on. Of course, they can own the spacecraft and the satellites and so on. That, that's property, right? But um, they shouldn't have any rights beyond that. We don't have the same principle in, in aviation, so no. We use we use real public international law sovereignty here based on the Westphalian uh, model of, of equality of states and all that stuff in the UN Charter. So we we we're in we're in legal certain hands, I think, with aviation, whereas with space law, it becomes there is sometimes less legal certainty. Absolutely. We can take just like maybe one more question. What, in your view, have been the most important outcomes of the convention, the Chicago Convention? Oh, wow. Most important outcomes of the convention. Well, uh, what's I think the most important thing is that uh, the convention has created ICAO. And ICAO, let's just be clear, ICAO, uh, International Civil Aviation Organization, you know, there's a secretariat there, uh, which is permanent, right? Uh, but otherwise, ICAO is the states. Uh, so you have all of these states represented. So it is a forum for states to come together and talk about international civil aviation. Uh, and I think that's something really unique. Uh, we see it also in maritime law and maritime with the IMO, but there, well, anyway, that's maybe for another day. There's, it's slightly more industry driven, I think, or there are certain states which are really big into shipping by sea, whereas aviation is something which affects us all. Um, Netherlands is a, is a relatively small geographic country, 
lots of people for the for the size, people living very close together, but it has a huge aviation uh, industry. Uh, Schiphol Airport here has been the biggest or most the busiest airport in all of Europe, surpassing London during the, the COVID crisis and so on. So that just gives you a sense that, um, you know, all states can come together big and small and, uh, and, and deal with things. Um, and you see success there. Uh, so I think that's the, that's the biggest, the best outcome of it. And then, of course, the second thing would be to create these rules, to create you know, a rule book that everyone plays by because uh, you can't be a, a rogue or a renegade in, in civil aviation. You might at the moment be able to do that in space to some extent, a pioneer. But I think in aviation, it's much more um, rules based and that's thanks to the Chicago Convention.